Church of Christ. We want to welcome uh, those of you that are tuning in online. Uh, please uh, take a look at your bulletin as there are lots of activities and things that uh, may be useful to you. And um, 
please uh, fill out a prayer card. If you have a prayer request that you'd like to share with the congregation, uh, please fill that out right away and I will uh, walk around and pick that up shortly. Uh, would you please stand for the call to worship this morning? Read it with me, please. But now, this is what the Lord says. He who created you, Jacob, he who formed you, Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. starting with verse 2 and going on to verses 4 and 5a. 
And I think what you're going to hear today in our songs and in our scriptures is that we have celebrated the birth of Jesus. And we quickly remind ourselves as why he came. He came <coughs> to redeem us, to save us, and to be our Lord, who comes in power and glory. So from Micah, but you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. He will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they will live securely, for then his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth, and he will be our peace. Let's sing together the great I am as we celebrate this mighty God.
what encouraging words in a world that is sometimes very discouraging. We worship the great I am. We stand in his presence today. Amen. Uh, a few prayer requests this morning from Joe Roop, um, her friend Lisa. Her son was killed in a car accident yesterday in Madison Lake. We need to pray for that family as they grieve this loss. Amen. Uh, Julie Bloom, uh, we need your prayers for her family as she lost her father recently. And again, we pray for that family as they recover uh, from that loss. And Betty uh, brings us news, uh, sad news from Nigeria. Uh, in a coordinated attack um, that lasted over three days, 175 people were killed in 30 different, 32 different communities. Over 220 houses were set on fire, and at least 450 people were injured uh, with gunshot wounds, burns, and lacerations. We need to pray for the Christians in Nigeria uh, recovering from this brutal attack. We should never be confused that we're not in a spiritual battle. And what we do here in our faith, in our commitment to God, we don't want to look weak. We don't want to look greedy. We are still in the presence of a great I am. Let's pray. Father, we humbly come before you and praise you sing praises to your name for your love <clears throat> for your power for your generosity for your promises we thank you for the relationship that we have in you we desire to walk closely with you guide our hearts and direct us as we struggle along the way Father, our hearts are heavy with the news of loss of family members. And we just ask that uh, you would be with these families who have lost loved ones. Let them feel your presence. Let them feel your comfort and your peace. Let them lean upon you. We pray for your the Christians in Nigeria. We just ask them be for strength and encouragement as they recover from such a brutal attack with the loss of many lives. Let our hope be in you, Father. Let us continually to trust you and to praise you and to worship you for the rest of our days. We ask these things in Jesus' name. December 31st, 2023, the bookend of the end of the year. Let me take you back to January 1st, 2023. How many of you made any resolutions you were going to keep this year? Well, to be fair, go ahead. We're not going to judge you. Nobody made any resolutions, commitments, any little things you were going You just don't want to admit that you didn't keep them at this end. I know what it's all about. There's something about this time of the year which with new beginnings and things coming to an end that helps us to maybe do a little evaluation, assessment. I was praying with Jeff today. I always do this this time of year. I think sometimes Karen would agree, I get obsessed with assessing, okay? Looking over the year, what are things that I was wanting to accomplish this year and now that the year has come to an end, what have I actually done? So this morning, I want to talk about bookends. Not as much about resolutions. That's, I'll let you do that on the aspect. But talking about things have beginnings, and they also have endings. That's the way that God designed things from the very beginning of time. There's a beginning of history, and there's going to be an end of history. That's the way reality is. If you have a card that I gave you, would you just make your way to the stage at this time? I've given out several cards. They're going to help us today. Talk about different bookends. All of these 
cards deal with different things from the Bible. Now, if you have an, an A card, Alpha, I want you to stand over to this side of the stage, over by the Christmas tree. And if you have one that looks like an upside-down horseshoe that's called Omega, I want you on this side of the stage, okay? All of these cards have got different things from the Bible that have a beginning point and an end, or at least the end of the story as we might have it. So what you're going to do, here's the Omegas, look at the clue on your card, and when I say go, I want you to find your Omega that matches the card that you're doing. And once you've matched, just find a place on the card and hold your Alpha and Omega up so that you have it in the right element. The Omega goes at the end of the bookmark in the beginning so we could see how they all match up accordingly, okay? You got it figured out? You don't, we're gonna go down. I know it's a little complicated, okay? <laughs> I told our elders this is a test to see whether they should continue in as being elders in the new year or long come up. Great, is glad he's not part of it from that standpoint, okay? Go! Find your match. Although here, we're going to find someone over here that's going to match it accordingly. Let's give them some encouragement, if you will. You can do this. Come on, find it. Now, that's Once you find your match, find a spot on the stage, match it up from that standpoint, and just find an area. All right, that's it. Just match up the beginning of that. Some of these are not that difficult. Okay, okay, all right. So, uh, that is not a match. You're going to have to find your other match. Sorry. <laughs> just to let you know that. I'm going to work it out here. Show me your matches to see where you're at here. So, um, so. Um, um, um. <clears throat> <clears throat> okay. Yeah. It's about a person who did those two things. There you go. All right. Well, you got that. Just see, it's very good. And it's, who, who was that person? Huh? I think it goes over here with this one, doesn't it? So you two are going to match up. In, in the process of elimination. All right. Hold on that standpoint. Let, let's see how well we've done here. Okay. Laid in a manger. Where did we find that one? Okay. Who was laid in a manger? You should know that. We just did it. And he eventually was send it into heaven at the end of his ministry. There's our bookends for that aspect. How about empty fishing nets? Talking about the fishermen in the scriptures. They were empty and the miracle of Jesus let me switch around here. There we go. <laughs> empty fishing nets were filled. There's our bookmarks of this miracle from that standpoint. How about floating in a basket? Who's got that one? Okay. Floating in a basket of the Nile. Who was that? Moses and Leading Israel across the Red Sea. God's design there and an aspect of how he used him as a tool in Egypt. How about earth empty and void? Sounds familiar? What, what is the beginning of what is known as creation? And at the very end was God's words. It is very good. Bookends of creation. Well done there, guys. And then we have a shepherd anointed king that would be david and we see as part of his life at least ending of his shepherding before his kingship slain the giant goliath well done and then i gave the two elders the easiest one that could be an aspect we have the book of genesis which is the first book in the bible and the last book is Rep, you guys did a good job. Let's give them all a hand, if you will. You can be seated. Thank you. I, I can see that. Oh, let's talk about the two bookends of the two books, books of the Bible. The last one, Genesis and Exodus. Genesis and Revelation, excuse me. Those two bookends of the Bible. Anybody who has a Bible knows, as you look at it, these are the two bookends of this, of the 66 books of the Bible. Genesis 1, we see this. If you got your Bibles which I have it, mine's right down here, hang on. Got to bring it to the stage. Genesis 1-1. Find that in your text, it's real easy. It's right at the beginning of the book, all right? From that standpoint. The NIV translation reads, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless, empty, darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God hovers over the waters. So we see as one of the bookends of our faith is that of God's role in creation. We see from the very beginning there's this authoritative influence 
that tells us where life came from. A creator God. There was darkness, there was void, there was empty, versus the very presence of God who brings about in his spirit light, validity, and he said, it's very good. Now, from the beginning, go to the other book in the book of Revelation, back to the very last chapter, 22. We see these words in verse 13. Sorry, verse 20. In verse 20, it reads, second to the last verse of the Bible. He who testifies to these things, he who is actually saying what we're hearing in the book of Revelation, says, yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. So at the beginning of the bookends of the Bible, we see God's presence in the midst of bringing bringing order and validity, goodness to darkness. And at the very end, we see this element of there's going to be an end. He's going to come soon. There's a destiny toward eternity that we find at the end of the Bible. And as we look at that, we understand there's an authoritative influence that God is going to hold in the midst of death. Now, a few verses just before that, back in verse 13, we see this. This one who's given the testimony, he says, I am the Alpha and Omega, bookends. I am the first and the last. I am the beginning and I am the end. What I want to talk about this morning as we close out this year is what is called a world view. How do you look at the world? What's your system of belief, your perceptions, your values, the very thing that determines what your actions will be, not just in this year that we are finishing, but in the year to come? What's the lenses that we use to look through to interpret the world around us? What is it that helps us define what is real, what is our purpose, and who we really are? Two bookends of what is called a biblical worldview that defines these very questions. It expounds in this comparison between God at the very beginning of time and God at the end of time. Literally, the book of Genesis means beginning. Darkness, void, empty. That's what the beginning was. And it was made very good by the moving of God's spirit. And guess what we read as we go on through Genesis and Exodus and Leviticus and the moving of God's spirit, bringing about goodness in the midst of that which is void and dark and evil. Then we get all the way to the book of Revelation. The book Revelation literally means unveiling, revealing. The book of Revelation is a style of writing called apocalypse apocalyptic it's it's word literally means uncovering now if you were part of our bible reading plan this last year there was an old testament and a new testament portion you have just or are now finishing the book of revelation i encourage you we have a new bible reading plan for the next year that you might pick up it's primarily focusing on the new testament this year but this year gives a little more opportunity for you to stop and ponder, focus, possibly even journal some questions and some observations of what you're reading and internalize those accordingly. Revelation in itself, if you've just now finished reading it, is really a fascinating, perplexing, challenging book. And as people in the church have read it and studied it, there's usually two primary camps you find people as they approach Revelation. Yet even though we find that these are two responses, both really have some unhealthy tendencies on how to treat the book of Revelation. The first group gets obsessed with the prophetic symbolism in Revelation. They treat it as a mysterious jigsaw puzzle that will give them some kind of insider information to the end times. It's interesting because as you read different authors and different perspectives, each of these puzzle pieces have a tendency to have a different meaning and a different conclusion. This obsession is, is brought about literally 
thousands of books and study guides that have intrigued people with timelines and impressive diagrams and charts that appear to give the answer to our questions about the future. And then the second group, when it comes to the book of Revelation, they just want to avoid it altogether. Either out of frustration or out of confusion, since it, it can't seem to make heads or tails out of it, these bizarre images and strange creatures and beasts and blood and bulls and horses of apocalypse and war and swords and pestilence and death. Why even try? Yet a good handle of understanding these two bookends, Genesis and Revelation, is a faith essential if you are going to have a healthy, biblical world view. From the beginning of time, Genesis, there was the moving of the Spirit of God, redefining darkness, void, and emptiness. And in the book of Revelation, there's completion. There's this transformation. That literally, darkness and void and emptiness is overcome and overwhelmed by light and validity. And it's very, very good. Revelation is a book that reveals completion of God's plan of redemption of the world. Found in the past, the present, and future. And it's all centralized in one influencing character. I am the Alpha and Omega. The first and the last. The beginning and the end. Revelation chapter 1. The beginning of the book of Revelation. Who is, who was, and who is to come? The Almighty. Revelation 21, the chapter before. It is done. The Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I give water with cost from the sp- without cost from the spring of life. You see, the central message of authority in that last book, the book into Genesis, the book of Revelation is this. Among the void and darkness is this overcoming spirit of God moving. In the triumphant message, which is this, hear me, that Jesus Christ is victorious Lord of all. Amen? From the beginning of time, Throughout eternity, the reigning restoration power of Jesus Christ is present in this world. John, who is the author of the book of Revelation, in his gospel account, John chapter 1, he records these words. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning through him. All things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. He, in him, is life. And that was the light of all mankind. It shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. John literally reframes for us Genesis 1, chapter 1. See, our worldview which defines us, our system of belief, which shapes our perceptions, our values, our actions, the lens for which we see and interpret the world around us. As believers in Jesus Christ, it is the authoritative influence, the moving of the Spirit of God in this world. It is the person of Jesus Christ. The bookends of biblical worldview that define our questions. What is real is Jesus. What is our purpose? It's Jesus. Who are we? It's defined in Jesus. One of the things that's helpful at the end of the year is to review some of the things that have taken place. I thought about going back over my sermons and finding some of the best clips of each week. I couldn't find any. But I did think that I'd like to just rehash this portion of a series that we did on Jesus, the name above all names. Because Jesus is the scarlet thread in Scripture. 
God unfolding his intentional pointing forward to a focal point, to his answer to mankind's eternal dilemma. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Remember when we went through the Bible? That scarlet thread of Jesus Christ. I'm not going to go through all the books, but here's just some again to remind us. In Genesis, Jesus Christ is the breath of life, creator God of the heavens and the earth. In Numbers, he is the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night, our ever-present guide. In Joshua, he is the captain of our salvation, the mighty conquering warrior leading the way into the promised land. In in Joshua, he is the captain of our salvation. In Ezra and Nehemiah, he is the rebuilder of the broken, shambled walls of human life. In Psalms, he is our shepherd whose rod and staff comforts us. In Isaiah, he is the suffering savior, the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, the prince of peace, wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. In Daniel, he is the fourth man in the fire, life's fiery furnace, an ancient of days who never runs out of time. In Micah, he is the messenger of beautiful feet, an everlasting ruler born to us in Bethlehem. In Zechariah, he is the pure son who every eye on earth will one day behold. He is the Lord of hosts. In Luke, he is the son of man, feeling what you feel, born to us in the city of David. In Acts, he is the Christ, the risen Lord, the hope of Israel, proclaiming salvation to the nations. In the Corinthians, he is the triumphant one, given victory, the spirit at work in the churches. In Colossians, he is our completeness, the firstborn of all creation, the image of the invisible God. In First and Second Timothy, he is our faith and our stability, the one mediator between God and man, the king of ages. In Jude, he is the foundation of our faith, God, our Savior, the one who keeps us from stumbling and, pres and presents us blameless in his presence. In Revelation, he is the Lion of Judah, the bright and morning star. He is the Alpha and Omega, the Lamb slain before the foundations of the world. He's the King of kings. He's the Lord of lords. Jesus is our coming King. Jesus is the first and the last, the beginning and the end, the keeper of creation and creator of all. He's the architect of the universe and the man manager of all times. He always was, always is, always will be, unmoved, unchanged, undefeated, never outdone. He was bruised and brought about our healing. He was pierced in his pain. He was persecuted. He was dead and he was brought to life. He is risen and brings power and reigns and brings peace forevermore. This is our Jesus. But we live in a time bombarded with news. But sometimes as we enter a new year, you wonder, is there hope? Let me remind you of the words of the Hebrew writer from the message translation in the 12th chapter. Oh, friend, when you find yourself flagging, failing in your faith, go over the story again. Go over the story of Jesus item by item, that long itinerary, the hostility that Jesus plowed through. Keep your eyes on Jesus, who has both began and finished this race that we all are in. Study how he did it, because he never lost sight of where he was headed. And an exhilarating finish in it and with God. Keep our eyes on Jesus, the New Living Translation says. You won't become weary and give up. What is 2024 going to bring us as Christians, as believers? I, I am not a prophet. Will there be hardship? Will there be persecution? Will there be trials? Yes. I know that because Jesus promised it. But there's hope. Because you see, I know who holds tomorrow. That's hope. As we turn the calendar to another year. Here are a few quotes I came across 
to hopefully inspire hopes. One is from an unknown author. I'm not afraid of tomorrow because I know God is already there. David Jeremiah quotes, we don't know what will happen tomorrow, but one thing I is guaranteed, God's overarching care for his children. We could be sure enough of that. In a world where nothing is sure, he is sure. Joyce Meyer quotes, you don't need to know what tomorrow holds. All you need to know is the one who holds tomorrow. And as a disciple of Jesus Christ, one who follows in his footsteps and follows his word, his quote, I am making you a disciple to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. And disciple, you are to teach them everything. Teach them to obey everything that I have commanded you. So be assured of this. In 2024, I am with you always till the very end. The bookmark of the age. You see, the biblical understanding of Jesus being with us is very different from the idea of Jesus' presence is giving us a boost in this life. Boost in your life to try to make the most of yourself. You see, surely I am with you always does not mean he's a miniature Jesus that you tuck away inside you. And as you move into 2024, an and, and, and inspiration that is part of your own personal ambitions, and you just pull him out to bring comfort to you when things don't seem to go your way. No, that's not what it means. It's about a worldview. It's about a belief statement that utilizes and shapes your perceptions and your values and your actions and how you're going to live this next year. Will you have a Christ-centered worldview? Instead of a, a, a miniature Jesus tucked away for your own personal objectives, you instead realize that your life, your life is little when it's taken into the greatness of who Jesus is. Because he is the Alpha, and he is the Omega, even going into 2024. This morning, as we prepare to sing a powerful song, I ask you this morning, what is your purpose in life? What is it that defines you? What is the bookends of your existence? As you come to the end of 2023 and you're making the transition here, are you ready for Jesus Christ, the Alpha and Omega? The question which is addressed in this song is this. Who is the cornerstone of your personal life? Who is the cornerstone of the future of this church? Just stand with your Jesus' blood and righteousness I dare not trust the sweetest frame But only trust in Jesus' name My hope is filled blood and righteousness I dare not trust the sweetest thing but wholly trust in Jesus name Christ alone cornerstone weak made strong Savior's love through the storm. He is Lord, Lord of all. Darkness seems to hide his face. I rest on his unchanging. 
dressed in his righteousness alone. Faultless stand before the throne. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the same. are reminded of God's plan of redemption of his people through the person of Jesus Christ. The babe that was born and we celebrated last Sunday was the perfect lamb that allows us to have certainty in our eternity. The person of Jesus. I don't worry over the future, for I know what Jesus said. And today I'll walk beside him, for he knows what is ahead. Many things about tomorrow I don't seem to understand, but I know who holds tomorrow, I know who holds my hand. And the path that is my portion may be through flame or flood, but his presence goes before me, because I'm covered with his blood. Thank you, Father, for Jesus Christ, that precious babe that became the precious Lamb of God. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Come. Come to the table.
As the sun rises on a new year, we reflect on the moments that shaped us, the challenges that tested us, and the joys that filled our hearts. In the ever-changing landscape of life, one thing has remained constant, our God. He is unchanging and steadfast. He walks with us through every stage of life. As we enter into this new year, we have the privilege of walking with the same mighty God. The same God who made a way when all else felt dark. The same God who is making an eternal home for us. His promises endure, bringing hope and light to every corner of our existence. With each sunrise, His love unfolds anew guiding us through the uncharted territories of the coming days. As we navigate the unknown, we cling to the certainty that His grace will be our compass, leading us towards a future filled with purpose and direction. We don't know what this year is going to bring, but we do know who is going before us and beside us. As we step into the new year, let us marvel at the wonders around us, let us find joy in the simple yet profound truth that our God remains the same. As we end this year and enter into a new year, let's all stand together with this. The words of this song on our lips, He is God alone.
things that you've showed us this last year where you are God alone. Thank you for so many impressions upon this body this last year. The, the blessings you have brought our way. Thank you for the financial stability. Thank you for the land purchase. Thank you for the new faces that we see. Thank you how you've inspired us to move forward in our hearts and our lives, to be more dedicated and devoted to you. And Father, as we now turn this page into a new year, we pray that you will prepare our hearts for even greater things that you will do among us and for your people in the power of the written and spoken word of Jesus Christ, through your spirit moving upon us in our church and in our individual lives. Show yourself to be God alone. And we pray the end of this year and the beginning of the new year in the name of our Savior, the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. Thank you for the confidence we find in him, the powerful name of Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen. Let's close out one more time with the Christmas hymn. To us, a son is given. Because he will save his people from their sin.